photograph for Joe and me tonight. He's going to take our picture. And the guy is always ahead of the game. He told me tonight he has his usual titles. He just plops right in. And he said tonight he ran out of all the titles. The only one he had left was a visit to the zoo for Joe and me. I was afraid he was going to say a vision of hell, but he did. Anyway, uh, you guys have heard me before on the street show. It's pretty much the same thing. When I address the group, there's usually three subcategories of people who pay attention. The first one is the group that says, I ain't going to die. I ain't going to ever get sick or disabled. That group doesn't have to pay attention. The next group says, yeah, I'll probably die, or I may become infirm or not able to manage my affairs. But the heck with the family. I don't like them anyway. Let them suffer and figure it out for themselves. They, again, don't have to pay the other group, but there's not many of those left, who says, yeah, I'm worried about my family, I'm worried about what happens if I pass away, or, selfishly for me, what happens if I become physically incapacitated, there's no one to manage my affairs. Those people really would want to pay a little bit of attention. Now, before we get into what is a, uh, an estate, most of you have things that work like a state. Practices. One of them you've got bank accounts held jointly. If one of the participants passes away, the account goes automatically to the survivor. You own a home in joint tenancy. Similarly, if one of the spouses passes away, it automatically goes to the other spouse with, by operation of law. If you have life insurance, the type Joe's talking about, you have a contract with the insurer as to who the beneficiary will be. That again operates automatically. The money will flow in the event of the passage of the policy, the insurer. Those matters are the type and stuff that the estate planning is built upon. But if you don't have those, or if they're incomplete for all of your asset disposition, then you've got one good friend who will work out a plan of distribution for you, and that's the state of Michigan. If you don't have a will, or if you have a will and a trust, it's inadequate, or if you have these types of provisions, your own joint tenancy, then the state will step in and tell you who your beneficiaries will be, and how much of their money they're going to get, and what proportion. So if you don't like that idea, having your best friend, the state, decide what to do for you, then you got to consider a state. What is a state plan? A state plan is essentially a scheme for the distribution of your assets should you die. But equally and as much important today is what about the management of your assets when you're alive but are unable or unwilling to manage them yourself. Then you have to get into a state planning. It's the only way you can adequately deal with those issues. What are some of the issues that you face when you want to think about estate planning? And we have a list of some of them. First of all, obviously, what the hell's the cost of estate planning, creating an estate will be? What will it cost to administer that? So that's a factor. Another big one will be probate avoidance. Can I set up an estate to avoid having to go to probate to get money out of anybody like a bank insurance company that holds assets of mine when I die and I want them to go to somebody else. The only way you're going to get those from those people who are holding assets in your name when you comp is probate. So you want to think about is there a way to avoid probate because probate is like gout. It may not be so bad but if you get it it ain't so good. So probate is not the worst thing to happen to you but it just, it's like a bad foot may not want to get involved with expensive and delays. So estate planning involves probate avoidance. Another real big issue today, less so, I'll explain in a moment, is taxes. When you die, the government wants taxes on the transfer of your property to anybody else. So estate taxes was a serious economic burden for most people. Today it's really been eliminated. There's only a few in this room that are worried about federal estate taxes. Joe, for example, back there, if you're a state, you have a deduction to start with of about $5.5 million. 
So if your state is under five and a half million dollars, you're not going to be worried about federal estate taxes. If it's a couple, you're doubling that. So you're almost $11 million. Other than Joe in this room, nobody's worried about that kind of money. So taxes used to be a major issue. Today, it's really not a significant issue in a death situation. The other, of course, the other issue, who the hell gets what? Who am I going to get to? So in planning your state, where do you want your assets to go? Who do you want to get them? State plan is the only way, other than the state of mission, that you're going to make that decision yourself. If you don't, the state will make it for you. How about issues of underage children? Big one. You've got minor children. If you don't deal with the state planning, then you may leave them at serious financial jeopardy. And as Joe pointed out, the classic one is when there's various ways money will go in test data or through private if it goes to a child when they reach 18, they're going to get that money. And it's just as there ain't a lot of people today who want an 18 year old to have a chunk of dough. The only way you're going to deal with that, even Cody would worry about him having that kind of money. So what, the only way you're going to work with that is something called trust. Inter vivas trust, testamentary trust, it's the only way you can avoid the child getting that at 18 have to have a trust. And most people don't want children at 18 to get money. And you can postpone it for quite a while with a trust. How about charitable contributions? The only way the state isn't interested in charitable contributions, but you might be. You want to leave something for the church, you want to leave something for the knights. So state planning is the only way you're going to do it. How about if you're in your business? Big or small? How will it be continued should you pass away? With the state planning, you can deal with that in the event you pass away where the business may be able to be continued. Without that, you're not going to be able to do that. The other issue not so prevalent in this room, although it may be a factor, is second marriage situations. How are you going to deal with the issues in the second marriage situation where there's children of both first and second marriage? If you don't do a state planning, you will have a disposition of assets probably not the way you want to have happen. How about a very serious one today in this house? Planning, only through a state plan. You've got special needs children. They turn out to be special needs adults. They have to have special care. If you don't provide for them with a state planning, they might be denied federal or state aid because they may wind up with some, a lot of your money that will preclude them from getting assistance. With estate planning for special needs children, adults, including yourself, you may be able to adjust it so that you get some, some support, but the, the government assistance will continue, but only through estate planning. Obviously with estate planning, unlike picking the state to handle things for you, some friend of the judge, probate court to handle for you, you can pick your representatives, you can pick your personal representative, you can pick if it's a trust who the trustees will be. Very important decisions, not one that you want some third party having no interest in you making those decisions. How about things like real estate? Where do you want the real How about a family cottage? You want to keep in the family. It's been in the family for years, you want to stay in the family. Without estate planning, that will end upon your death. How about for people who are worried about being subject to lawsuits? Asset protection. You can structure with estate planning ways to protect your family and you from liabilities that might be coincidental to the type of profession you're in. Doctors, dentists, machinists, repair people that might be exposed to lawsuits. You can minimize the risks. Another big one for this group in here and for all of us today, Medicare, Medicaid, planning. You have certain assets you just soon not go to the government when you die or after you've been cared for with Medicare or Medicaid. And you want to be able to be eligible to preserve those assets, keep your, your home, while, and make yourself still eligible for Medicaid. The state planning one of the ways you can address that type of situation. How about another one? Unmarried couples. If 
families, domestic partnerships. What about those situations which are becoming more prevalent today? Maybe not for people in this room, but when they have relatives, children, who are involved in marriages where they're living together, or they become now uh, uh, same-sex couples. And what about planning for them and for you? Planning where your assets will go for them. Estate planning is probably the only way, it is the only way, you can be able to address those type of situations. And they're quite prevalent today. Now in terms of dealing with your state, as I told you before, when God uh, created Earth, on the eighth day he created a special asset called non-probatable assets. They're assets which really are outside of this traditional planning. They're important tools that involve planning. But they're things where probate court's not involved with, and you're not necessarily involved with at first blush. And they're those ones we talked about before. Property that's outside, they're non-probatable assets. Assets held by a trust, they're not probatable. Property held jointly, your home, joint tenancy, bank accounts, joint tenancy. Those also are non-probatable assets and don't get involved with the probate court. Most so of them, estate planning has to be done with some care because you can grossly distort the distribution. You take, you have one daughter, so I'm gonna put the house in my daughter in my name and the other kids, well, she'll care for them when I go because that's my major asset. Well, you die and the daughter gets the house, she may not have the same thoughts you had about who's going to share in the value of that home. So you have to consider, well, joint tenancy is one way you can deal with the dissolution of assets. You have to be careful about distorting what you really want by an estate plan. I want all the kids to share with me. So because same thing, I got a daughter and I got a son, I'm going to put them on my bank account. Joint bank account. It's a convenience. Well, her husband's driving her car and he runs into a school bus. The next thing you know, you've got lien on your savings and checking account because the plaintiffs in the case found out that the wife, your your daughter, is a joint holds a joint account with you. All of a sudden, they say that money belongs to them, and you put a lien on the account. You can't. All of a sudden, your money's not available anymore, it may be gone. That's the risk you have with joint accounts. Uh, the other type of asset that is not probatable is the one by contract. You have a 401k or an IRA. And what do you got in there? Typically, as Joe points out, make sure you know it, you've got in there by contract who receives that property in the event that you pass away. That's by contract. Insurance, life insurance is the same way, it's by contract. Your employee benefits that may survive your death, again, by contract, you designate who will get those. Those are not probatable assets, but they are important factors to be considering in estate planning. Other types of non-probatable assets, you may encounter them, pay on death, transfer on death, stock, securities, where you by contract are told corporation, bank, or the thrift institution, in the event of your death, you want it to pay to someone else. Pay by death by contract. Those are outside. Now, if you don't have a trust or a will, or if you do and there's property that's not properly covered, then you fall into intestacy. And intestacy is the one where I mentioned early. In that case, there's no one to decide who's going to get the property. The state of Michigan will tell you who's going to get that property and what amounts and what proportions. So, uh, for example, today if you had a couple and there's no will, no trust, and one of the parents passes away, then typically today by intestacy in Michigan, the surviving parent will get something like $250,000 out of the estate. The balance will be divided among the children and the surviving spouse. What happens? All of a sudden, the kids have a bunch of dough that maybe have to be held in trust. You may have to appoint, by court, conservators to hold that money so you can now all of a sudden see what's going to happen to the fi financial aspects of a family where a good chunk of it is being held 
you buy a custodian for the better of the kids who, what, get it at 18. So it puts a great distortion on the management of a family after the death of one of the spouses where there's no will or trust because it's intestate. The state of Michigan told you who get that money. I just gave you an illustration where that might be. Uh, so when you have an estate plan, what is it? It's basically a series of documents. And I'll cover a few of the documents that typically involve. Like a lawyer should deal with pieces of paper. So with the estate planning, a will. And a will is the typical, one of the basic tools in estate planning. The will, however, is a ticket to probate. And you just don't normally want probate. You want to avoid probate. But a will automatically to make it operate has to be probated. A will, of course, will provide who gets what, where your property will go when you pass away. Problem with the will, you can leave it to children. What happens again? They have to get it when they're, they're eligible to get it when they're 18, and you don't want them. So, but a will will say the children get it, the minor children, but when they're 18, they get the money. You don't want that to happen normally. Of course, a will also can provide some flexibility and put assets where you want them to go. Personal property can also be changed frequently with a list that you can give to your one gun or fishing rod on Paloui and the next day give it to your Aunt Tilly. So that has some flexibility. However, a will only operates when you die. Otherwise, it has no effect. It has no effect while you're alive. It only becomes operable upon your death. So that's one type of document that's typically involved. A will also involves the recommendation of a personal representative who will manage the property of the estate when you pass away, collect funds, put them all together, pay taxes. You can also, in a will, for, for families with minor children, recommend guardians for the children who will care for them, both their estates and persons. That's a provision you typically find in a will. Addresses issues of simultaneous death. As Joe mentioned, you may be in a car going home tonight. You get overrun by a United Aircraft airplane, lands on you, and both die simultaneously. <clears throat> Problem with that, you're going to wind up probating two estates, not one but two. If you have a will, both of them are assumed that they, they both equally survive and you now have to probate two estates. Of course, the will typically can designate final arrangements, where you want to be buried, how you want to be buried, what songs you want at your service. Those are things in the will. Now the big one, which obviously is the granddaddy and the most important of all, the one that every rational person should have, the other type of document is a trust. Typically we talk about intervenous trust created during your life, They're typically revocable. What do they do? First thing they do, they avoid probate. We've said before, because assets held by a trust are not probatable. So you, everything is handled with the kitchen table. You don't have to go to probate. There's no hearings on anything. Everything operates automatically. It's effective when you create the trust during your life immediately. It takes place right away. It operates while you're alive and make provisions for, most importantly, what happens if you're not well. It provides for your care. It provides in the event that you don't want to continue to manage your assets. Your successor trustee can step in and run it. You select a trustee, and typically on these trusts, for the husband and wife, typically it's a joint trust. Both are the original trustees. If one passes away or is disabled, surviving spouse, continues as a trustee, there's no change, and it just continues right on like a corporation. There's no change, there's no probate. And then, of course, if the second passes away, then you have appointments of a successor trustee, usually an adult child, someone you trust, who can manage and operate, just continue. There's no change, no abruption, no court proceedings. It just continues on. That's the beauty of them. It simplifies all the management of your assets while you're alive and after you're dead because it doesn't involve probate, it doesn't involve a court. Typically, if you're done with minimal legal involvement with a lawyer, it 
done at the kitchen table. Everything is taken care of. It just operates smoothly with no interruption. It, again, again, it provides funds in case you're disabled, provides the fund and the means to care for you and, care for, and manage your estate. It's the only way you can do it is with a trust. And again, for children, you can defer them getting anything for many, many years. You can dole it out in installments. You can control them so if they're not behaving well, the trustee doesn't have to disperse funds, can manage their education or schooling. But if they're in serious, serious misbehavior, the trustee can step in and not and slow up the money that's going to them, but provide for their care. The only way you can do that is with a trust. Again, you can also, while you're alive and disabled, it can provide support for your dependents. That why even if you're alive, care for children, minor children, adults, because you specify it in the trust. The other beauty of these, they're typically revocable. You can tear them up, end them at any time, change them. The flexibility is infinite. And that, of course, is one of the essential beauties of them. The other factor, they're private. No one knows about them except you. They're not public records. You administer them privately and only within the group, only within your family confines. That's the other, that's the main important document for a well-designed estate plan. Other documents typically involved in, there's a second unique type of will called a poor will, typically found with trust, and that's a will that operates like a normal will, except it provides for assets that you forgot to put in the trust or it continued, didn't have in the trust, and it pours them back into the trust so it's distributed out through the trust. They're easy because there aren't many assets, there's only one beneficiary of the trust, they're inexpensive to probate, but in case you forget something after you put everything into the trust, you bought another house somewhere, forgot to put it in the trust, it'll fold back through the pour over will, back into the trust, be distributed and controlled by the trust, but it has to be probated, but it's a pour over will. Other documents you typically find in the state plan, and Joe mentioned something very important, powers of attorney. You want to usually uh, appoint your spouse, as the agent to manage your affairs if you're unable or disabled, then the spouse can handle all things, get you into the nursing home, do things where otherwise you'd have to have a conservator appointed to have your signature be authorized by some agent. Typically with a power of attorney, all that is handled. You usually take your surviving spouse. And then with minor children who will follow the surviving spouse, as the agent, powers of attorney. That's the financial power. There's another power that all of us are equally interested in, it's typically the state plans, and that's in a health power. Who's gonna step in in case you can't manage your health, you're in the hospital, end of life situations, you wanna make the decisions, so you make those decisions in these powers of attorneys and authorize and <laughs> patient representative to step in and operate under that power of attorney health. That's generally the other type of documents that's in, in a state plan. And that's really it. Uh, the taxes, which I said used to be a major discussion in state planning, fortunately is not much of it, unless you're in an estate area where you've gotten more than $12 million for college. Not many. But many people have the old estate plans where you have duplicate and complicated trust. The thing today is get rid of those, make the trust simpler. If you have one of those, to get back to the simpler trust formats. And that's it in a nutshell. But basically, anybody who doesn't have a revocable trust isn't operating like rational. They're simple, they're, they provide great flexibility, they're inexpensive. And if something happens, you really will want to have it. And that's it. Thank you.